Well, good morning, everyone. Um, glad to see you here. Just want you to know that as Christmas approaches, I made a, a pledge this Christmas, made a promise to my wife that I would make three projects for my daughters, my, my daughter Kaylee and my two daughter-in-laws, uh, Jennifer and Krista. And so I made this pledge to her, and I'm just a novice woodworker. I mean, I'm really, really, really bad, actually, but I'm trying to learn how to do a few things. But she asked me to do these projects, and so, uh, you know, I was excited, and I said yes, I kind of made this promise, and so I've been working on them. And first thing was a mirror that my daughter wanted, just a, a mirror with a real wide wood frame around it, which, you know, you can go and buy, but uh, no, but she wanted me to make it. So I, uh, I, I agreed to do that, so I went to the store to look for a frameless mirror. And I found one, but it was a little fancy, kind of beveled edge, and, and I really didn't need that. And it was, you know, about 26 bucks. And I looked over and I saw they had this, this, these ones that had this little cheap, little thin frame around it for like $6.99. I thought, hey, I'll just take that and I can take that little frame off of it and then put my frame on and that'll be good. So I took it home, started working on it, didn't get real far, and I cracked the mirror. So, okay, all right, I'm down seven bucks. So I went back to the store and I figured, okay, I think I know what I did wrong. And I think if I am a little bit more careful, take my time, I think I can do it. So I bought another one, okay, another $6.99. And I take the mirror home and I, I did a lot better on this one. I got the frame all the way off, like four foot by two. And I got it all the way off for about the last three or four inches. And sure enough, mirror cracks again. And so now I'm down, you know, 14 bucks plus a lot of time. I go back and get the $26 beveled edge. So then I come back and I finally got the frame around it. So that one down, two to go. The second project I did, I had some problems with it, but I had done one before, so I was able to get that finished. The third one is a little bit ambitious. It wants a uh, headboard for a queen size bed. And, uh, you know, the, all the rage now is this, you know, reclaimed wood, which is really expensive per linear foot. And, uh, but I found this guy up in Salado who, it's not really a lumber yard. It's just, he kind of, you know, it's by appointment only. And, uh, you know, he goes and travels places and tears down this old barn and brings back the wood. And, and if you can catch him, and it's kind of a cash only kind of deal, <laughs> you know, you know, so I went up there and trekked through the mud, picked out some wood, threw it in my F-150 because that's why we drive pickup trucks. And we uh, hauled the lumber home, started working on it. Didn't get real far, just trying to get a frame kind of in place, and it was slow going, and I'm working on this one little joint, and, and this friend comes over to see Kathy, and she looks at it, and she says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm, I'm building a, a headboard, and she looked at it, and she was trying to figure out, like, how could that possibly be true? And then she says something like, you know, you should call my brother. He's really good work, woodworker. <laughs> what a vote of confidence. Actually, I'm just giving her a hard time. But anyway, she's there to pick up Kathy. They're on their way to this craft kind of thing, uh, a market, you know, some kind of fair thing. And uh, uh, the couple putting it on is Bobby and Amy Pruitt. And a lot of you know Bobby and Amy Pruitt. He was on staff here a number of years, and we sent him to Hutto to take over our uh, uh, church plant in, in Hutto. And great, great couple, but like I've known Bobby for 20 years. I don't think that Bobby could actually get the top off a peanut butter jar. I, I, the guy can't do anything with his hands. And now like he's, they're doing this stuff and they're selling it. And so like, I'm all kind of thinking, man, like how in the world is he, he knows how to do this stuff and I don't know what I'm doing. And, and then all of a sudden I get pinged from, <laughs> Kathy's at the trade fair. She sends me a video. In the video, I should have shown it to you, but Bobby's kind of prancing around. If you know Bobby, this is so Bobby Pruitt. He's kind of prancing around this little table saying, yeah, Danny, I made this. I did this. I know you don't believe it, but I did this. And I'm looking at my, my, my woodwork and I'm thinking, man, am I ever going to get this thing finished? You know, sometimes when you, when, when you make a pledge, you make a commitment. Along the, along the way, you kind of come into some problems. Sometimes you come into difficulties. Sometimes you come into uh, distractions or discouragement. It kind of gets in the way, but I'm determined. I'm going to get this done. I've got a few more days, don't I? So I'm going to get through this thing. And well, the same thing that I've experienced on this project is what the Corinthians were experiencing with a pledge that they had made. And if you were with us last Sunday, you remember that we were looking at the fact that the Corinthians, along with other churches in kind of the ancient Asia Minor area, along the northern rim of the Mediterranean, 
Like they had made these pledges to give a certain amount of money, whatever God had laid on their heart, that was going to the poor in Jerusalem. They were experiencing famine. Uh, they were also under persecution. And a lot of Christians were like without income. And, and so for a number of reasons, Paul the Apostle was letting people know what's going on. And so they were collecting money to go back to help the Christians in Jerusalem. And so uh, Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and we've started looking at these two key chapters, chapter 8 and chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians. He writes them to encourage them to follow through with the commitment that they had made. In fact, uh, last week we looked at chapter 8, verses 1 through 9, and we saw that the key verse of the passage was the fact that uh, Paul appeals to Christmas. He appeals to the Christmas story of how God himself became a man. He left this glorious riches of heaven and he came to earth and he gave his life away so that we who were poor spiritually might become rich spiritually. In fact, let me show you that verse. This was the key verse from, the week, from last week's message. For you know, he says to the Corinthians, the grace of our Lord Jesus that though he was rich, he existed in heaven with all the glories of, of, and all the perks and privileges of being God, being the center of all the angelic host attention. Uh, uh, the Lord Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the agent of creation, God of gods. He's, he's, he's in heaven. He's preexistent. Jesus didn't begin in the manger. God existed in all this glorious richness, if you will. And it says, though he was rich, he became poor. He was born in this lowly manger. And so God moved from being uh, a spiritual to material. You could touch him. But even as a material man, he lived a very materially poor life. So that by going to the cross and dying for our sins, paying the price for our sins and being raised from the dead, that those who would believe in him and trust him, that he would be able to make them spiritually rich that we would be able to join him in the glorious riches of heaven. So that in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says of you and me, all of us who have placed our faith in Christ, that we have been blessed with spiritual blessings in the high places. And so that's an example of these spiritual riches that come at the expense of the material loss to, uh, of Jesus giving his life away. So last week, what we said is that Paul, in, in talking about Christmas, revisiting the incarnation, he says that becomes our motivation for why we would also kind of become less materially rich, like that we would give away some of our stuff so that others could be benefited spiritually or even materially. So we give away just like God gave away himself. And so he's our motivation and he's our model is what we learned last week. So as we come back to the passage today, Paul is going to kind of reiterate something he said last week, which is namely to the Corinthians like, hey, you made a commitment. You started out with real eagerness and desire. Just follow through with it. And then he's going to turn a corner and he's going to talk about the men who are actually going to travel to Corinth and receive the gift that they assembled together. And he's going to talk about what kind of men these are, and he's going to kind of make the point that people who are givers need to have confidence that the one who is going to be receiving the gift are going to be using the gift as intended. And so that's important to us. We think about that in our own culture, don't we? So uh, we're going to look at those two things today. First of all, kind of the, the commitment completion, and then second, confidence in the collectors. So with that in mind, turn with me to 2 Corinthians 8, if you're not there already, and I'll take us through. I'm just going to read the first half of what we'll cover today, uh, starting with verse uh, 10. Uh, Paul picks up and he says, And in this manner I give my judgment. This benefits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it as well, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. 
as it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. He's quoting there from Exodus chapter 16. We'll talk about that in a moment. But first of all, if you're following along on the outline, the first point to consider is simply this, is that we regift Christmas by turning eagerness into readiness. We regift Christmas by turning eagerness into readiness. Okay, so twice you may have picked up that he talks about their desire. And like what did, when they started and that it was out of desire. And giving is always that way. Uh, giving is never like, um, you know, uh, like where you feel compelled, where you feel obligated, where you feel pressured. But that God works in us and it's part of actually the new birth that a believer experiences when they become a Christian, that God's very presence enters their life, and he starts kind of awakening all kinds of holy desire within us. And part of that is that God really gives us a desire to give, to, to, to meet needs of people, to give to the cause of Christ. And so he says to these Corinthians, remember like the desire that you had, he says, turn it to willingness. He repeats this word desire a couple of times, as well as the word readiness. So we re-gift Christmas. We model what Jesus did with the Christmas story by when uh, we turn eagerness into readiness. A couple of uh, uh, points here to observe. is First of all, notice that it is a readiness to actually do. Where I move from willingness uh, to, you know, uh, eagerness and willingness to actually following through and, and doing it. And uh, he, he makes that point a couple of different times. He uses the word complete. Uh, he says, uh, uh, finish doing it as well so that your readiness and desiring it may be matched by completing it. So he just makes that point of like, okay, just doing it. That's part of moving from eagerness to readiness is doing it. The second thing, though, is he's going to talk a lot about the idea of dependence. Okay, that when you think about doing it, uh, it's going to require real dependence on God and God's family. Now watch what he's saying here. He's going, okay, here are the saints in Jerusalem. that They're really in need. And so we're talking to you guys, uh, Paul's saying to the Corinthians, and saying, okay, if you, you're going to make a gift... And the the goal here is not that you become real burdened so that they're in abundance. The idea would be that you're going to give so it's meeting their needs, but you're not overwhelmed yourself. So in other words, the idea isn't to create a deficit for you. The idea is to create instead a sense of dependence. So here's the idea. What he's saying is that Sometimes, in the family of God, you're a giver. And sometimes you may need to be a receiver. Uh, sometimes, like God uses your regular gifting, or, or of course the context here is this over and above giving. He says sometimes God uses that gift to meet needs of people, but then one day when you have need, he says to the Corinthians, that they may supply your need. Now, I don't know if you ever think about that very much, but like, you know, people are aware in this church we have a benevolence ministry and, you know, we help people from outside our church, but uh, it's also really targeted for people inside our church. So people who uh, sometimes run in into expenses, unforeseen expenses, medical expenses, hard times, lost job. I mean, people sometimes fall themselves in need. And so the church like, meets those needs through the giving of the people here in our church. So that's one way that we, we kind of give to help people. And then when we're in need, that others help us. Like, that's how God intended that the body of Christ would work together. And so what he's talking about here is that we live with a sense of dependence on God. Like one of the things that frees me up to give generously is to know that my God's got my back. Now, we don't believe in the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel basically says, you give a hundred, God's going to give you back a thousand. Okay, nowhere in scripture do you get that idea. That's not what we believe. But what God says is that when you live a life of dependence on me, he says, seek me first, my kingdom, my righteousness. 
He says all these things, these basic needs, clothing, food, like I'm going to take care of those things for you. So a person who's generous has a real confidence that God, and usually through the body of Christ, is going to take care of their needs. And that frees them up not to hoard way over and above what would be reasonable to do. Uh, so like, we all you know, we purchase insurance. I think that's wise. You have some short-term savings, some long-term savings. That's wise. But the, the, the mindset that says, I'm going to hoard all that I can so I can be self-sufficient, completely independent. I don't need anything. I mean, why would I ever pray, Lord, give me your, this day my daily bread? I mean, I've got that taken care of. That mentality doesn't reflect faith. What he's saying is that let's live in a way where we're free because everything we have belongs to the Lord. Let's give as the Lord directs. And so if, when we're in need, the Lord will direct others to help us. Kathy and I have experienced that a, a, a number of times. When we went up to seminary, um, we, were, we were poor seminary students. We had a couple of kids. Kaylee wasn't born yet. And uh, we had a little bit of help from Conroe Bible Church and uh, uh, had some help from my dad. And, but uh, I, I worked UPS uh, and went to school all day. And, and you know, we, we got by. I mean, there were times when it was, it was really slim pickings. And I, I remember we would have a friend drive in from Conroe, and they would just drive up, and they would just unpack their station wagon with just so many sacks of groceries I could, could not even imagine. Uh, we, Kathy and I were counting up the other day. We, we've had, I think, six or seven different cars given to us over the course of our time in ministry where like, people would just offer to do this. Now, I know that that's, that's probably different from your experience, but that's just a case in point of how the Lord has always taken care of us. And through times of being really, really tight, in times where we had a little bit more abundance, we always practiced this habit of giving and trusting that God was just going to take care of us. And I can tell you story after story after story. When this church was planted back in 2000, uh, there were 64 adults who signed the charter that said, yeah, we're going to make this happen, God willingly. And those 64 families all kind of came forward and they said, you know what, in order to get this church off the ground, we're going to pledge so much money and first fruits giving, and here's what we're going to give throughout the rest of the year. And I, we, we kind of did that when the church started. And Kathy and I, like, we, we, we wanted to make a, a, a sizable first fruits gift and then plus what we were going to pay through the rest of the year. And, and so we, we kind of prayed together and, and arrived at a sum together. And for us at that time, it was a pretty significant number. And after we made the pledge, we received an anonymous cashier's check for the same amount of money. And it was incredible to us. I mean, no one could ever see that coming. And I've heard stories of other of you who have made pledges and made commitments and then have seen God, you know, give you a raise, give you back retro pay from some benefit, do any kind of unpredictable things that, that kind of help supplement or make those pledges happen in, in a reality. And I've heard of others who like made pledges and they didn't receive any kind of special thing like that. Like, it was, it's not like there's some kind of guarantee, but that God just sustained them and helped them like follow through with commitments that they made. That's what Paul is saying here. That part of regifting Christmas is this idea of dependence on God. And then he ends this part of the passage with quoting out of Exodus 16. You remember that that's when the, the people of Israel are out in the wilderness. And they're hungry. And God says, I'm going to provide for you manna every day. You know, this, this new substance is going to fall from heaven. And you can go in the morning, you can gather up what you need. And some people would go out and just gather all they could possibly get and bring it in. And others would just kind of gather just a little, just what they thought they needed. And then it says here, as you, as you can see, he says, whoever gathered much had nothing left over. In other words, they were thinking, hey, let's, let's get so much to make sure that we have you know, what we need in case, in case like it doesn't happen tomorrow. Right? Maybe, it, maybe the manna doesn't fall tomorrow, but we've, we've gathered in so much. And he says, those people, they didn't have any left over. But the ones who went out and just gathered little for that day, he says, they didn't lack anything. And what God is teaching the nation of Israel 
And what Paul's trying to enforce with the Corinthians, and what we need to hear today, is that when it comes to getting and letting go of your stuff, that God says, you just depend on me. Uh, that I will meet your needs for that. So that, that's part of what, what's going on here. There, there's this readiness about dependence on God. Kathy and I have uh, really praised God that in each of the campaigns that we've done, that he's allowed us to give significantly, and we've never lacked. I remember when we bought this land and built this building, uh, we wanted to make a really big gift, and we had kids in college and you know all the expenses related to that. And, and God like, enabled us to... to to like make a big pledge and we see that happen. We didn't lack at all. Same thing with, with O Love Only. I know some of you have had that same experience as well. So I'm encouraged by this, what Paul is saying to the Corinthians, not only because I believe it's true in the Word of God, but I personally have experienced this and have known of many, many others of you could testify to that as well. So first thing is this idea to re-gift Christmas is to turn from eagerness into actually uh, readiness to follow through. But now he turns the corner. It's, I find this, uh, this part of a passage fascinating because he's going to spend the next eight verses talking about the men who are actually going to come and receive this gift from the Corinthians. And so there's going to be a delegation of men. I take it from this passage that they're not only coming to uh, Corinth, but they'll probably go to Athens. Uh, they'll go up to Macedonia, where we learned last week that they were eager to get in on this. And uh, they'll go up to Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea and a number of different churches. And so this delegation that's, that's collecting this money. And Paul knows how important it is that people have confidence in the people who are going to be receiving and handling, managing those financial gifts. Because ultimately, when we give, we give to Jesus. But in order to give to Jesus, we give to the leaders of his bride, the church as will be described here in just a moment. So let's take a look at this. Um, there's a lot of scams. A lot of Christmas scams. We could talk about the 12 scams of Christmas. There's a lot of on the internet where you have to beware. And uh, also during this year where charities, people take advantage of people wanting to do charitable giving and a lot of unhealthy stuff. And uh, Paul was sensitive to the same thing. So let's look at the qualifications that he has here. This point in your outline, I would say, is... Uh, Regift Christmas by trusting leaders who are reliable. Trusting leaders who are reliable. So picking up with verse 16, it says, But thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same earnest care I have for you. For he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he is going to you of his own accord. With him we are sending the brother who was famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. And not only that, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that is being ministered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our goodwill. We take this course so that no one should blame us about this generous gift that is being administered by us, for we aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. And with them, we are sending our brother whom we have often tested and found earnest in many matters, but who is now more earnest than ever because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker for your benefit. And as for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. So give proof before the churches of your love and of our boasting about you to these men. All right, that's a mouthful, isn't it? So he's got several things to say. In fact, I think we can observe at least six different parts of the qualifications of these men. And I would dare say that it's the same qualifications that we would want to know about any organization that we're going to invest money in, whether it's this church and the leadership here or any other organization. And so this is helpful to us to look at. First thing I would suggest to you is simply the idea of loyalty to the family loyalty to the church family, that these people, these delegates, these are men who care about these people, the Corinthians. Watch what Paul says about Titus. He says, thanks be to God who put it in the heart of Titus, okay, the same earnest care, and you'll, you'll find this word earnest repeated all through this passage. It means genuine, it means sincere, in that Titus has this real sincere care for the Corinthians. 
It's like he's invested, he's committed to their care, not just their cash. <laughs> he, like, he cares about how they're doing spiritually. He says he put it in, 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 into Titus's heart. He says, for he not only accepted our appeal, in other words, Paul asked him to go, would you be part of this team to go in, uh, to Corinth? But we find out that he, in his own desire, his own earnest, that he was going of his own accord. Okay, so he's like committed to this thing. He's committed to what God is doing in the heart and in the lives of the Corinthians. He says, he's not only accepted our appeal, but he, I'm sorry, read that. Verse 18, with him, we are sending the brother who was famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. I love that. You know, like this guy's unnamed, but apparently it was someone that they would know. He's famous for preaching the gospel among all the churches. And I think this introduces this next point that in addition to just loyalty and care for the Corinthians, it's the idea of plurality. It was the idea that people uh, would never uh, entrust money to one individual. There were going to be a plurality of men who come. Notice he says, uh, uh, in addition to Titus, we're sending this one who's famous about preaching. Uh, later, he's going to talk about another uh, unnamed brother who's also going to be going. And one of the things that is helpful to know is that uh, whether, uh, certainly at this church, is that no one person ever has control of the money. Uh, that begins from the, moi- uh, from the moment that, re- you know, that giving happens, like the plate is passed, or whether it's through online giving. Like the money is always managed by a plurality of people uh, uh, c- uh, w- w- with great character uh, who have uh, the reputation like that we trust like how they're handling the money. And then ultimately, of course, it's our elder board who oversees the distribution of those funds. And so plurality is very important. Some of you have had experiences. You've been at a church or you know of others who are at a church where it was just kind of a single pastor-led church and he kind of controlled the books and, you know, and he, you know, so, you know, you kind of get friendly with the books and, you know, you start dipping into the books. And like some of us have been through experiences where we've seen that happen. Well, Paul would say, hey, there should never be just one guy handle the money. So he's not sending just Titus, even though he's got great confidence in Titus, as he's going to say in a minute, that we don't want to do anything that would give anybody any question about the appropriateness of how this is handled. And so he sends plurality. The third thing I want you to see is what I would just call this uh, priority, that it is uh, the priority of giving glory to God. So I continue in verse 19, and not only that, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that is being ministered by us, and then here's the phrase, for the glory of the Lord himself, and to show our goodwill. And what Paul is saying is like, hey, these guys are participating in this for the glory of the Lord. It's not so that they can look good. It's not for self-promotion purposes. It's not so they can get to Jerusalem and say, hey, look what we've done and I kind of call glory to themselves. It's all about the glory of the Lord. And it's, it's worth noting that God is, is greatly glorified by our giving. When done from the right heart, you know, by the right motive of joy, uh, by the power of God's Spirit, God receives much glory from that. So the next thing I want to point out in this long description here is what I would just call the validity of this team of people, that they have a proven track record or that they have uh, uh, the kind of integrity um, that's needed here. Uh, You think first about integrity when it says, uh, we take this course so that, verse 20, we take this course, in other words, we're doing it this way because we don't want anyone, that no one should blame us about this generous gift that is being administered by us. For we aim at what is honorable. And watch this, not only in the sight of the Lord, in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. Like, so this integrity, this idea of, of honesty, this idea of being honorable, uh, um, he says it, it's not enough that just God alone knows that we're dealing with this money with integrity. He says it's important to us that all of those involved would also have that same level of confidence. It's a big deal to Paul 
you know, that people would feel that way. And so he talks about that, and then he gets into the validity idea about a proven track record. Verse 23, he says, As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker for your benefit. And as for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. I love this phrase that, um, uh, verse 22, says, We're sending our brother whom we have often tested, often tested, and found earnest in many matters. And so what he's saying again about these guys is that these are not men who are unknown to us. These are men who are familiar to us and who have proven their integrity over time in handling all kinds of matters. That's a big deal. That that really encourages confidence, does it not? Okay, these are not novices. These are not brand new believers. These aren't some guys who were in jail recently for stealing, but they've come to Christ and we think that you know they're ready to handle money. These are people who've proven themselves over time. And then finally, the most important, I think, uh, uh, part of their credibility is that they have the recommendation of the churches. He says, uh, so uh, as for Titus, he's my partner and fellow worker. And as for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Uh, You see how he's describing the churches as the glory of Christ? Elsewhere, the church is called the bride of Christ. Did you know that you, as a believer in connection with other believers, involved in this thing that he created called the church, that you are part of the bride of Christ, or what is described here as the glory of Christ? And that one of the best credentials of these delegates is that the bride of Christ, the church, has chosen them, has said, we're behind them. More important than how many letters follow your name, you know, how many degrees you have, what your education, like more important than that is that the local church of believers say, like, we're behind this guy. And so that's what Paul is saying there. So at least six different things that he says of these folks to develop confidence in those who are going to make the collection. Well, what significance does that have for us today? Well, here's, here's kind of a, a, a transition that you need to be aware of. So in the early church, you had the, the apostles. And so they're, they're centered now at this point in our study of Acts. They're, they're in Jerusalem. And so you have just the one church in Jerusalem. But then the church is going to start growing and reproducing and multiplying. And so the next church will be in Antioch up in present-day Syria. Uh, then the church is going to spread through all this northern tip of the Mediterranean area throughout really the known Roman world by the time the New Testament comes to completion. And so the leadership of the church, which is the apostles, that starts moving out where now these, uh, uh, these officials or leaders called elders, and it was always a plurality of elders, take over leadership of the, each individual church. And so now for each church that is doing giving, that money doesn't come to the 12 apostles, that money comes to the elders of each individual church. And they were responsible for receiving it, managing it, and distributing it as God led. And so by way of application, it just comes down to like, who are the elders of our church? And these are men whom the congregation here has affirmed. Uh, These are men who have these track records that we would stand up and point to either one of them and say, these men meet these qualifications. And so as all of you who consider end of year giving or you consider like involvement with Olav only, you need to have confidence that the elders of this church who will not know who gives or how much someone gives, they don't know that. We don't want to know that. There's other, we have somebody else who processes that information. But like our elders, like the ones who distribute and manage these gifts, these are men of great character and repute. So last week, we introduced you to Dan and Tony Magura. Dan's one of our elders. Dan was a guy who was not here th- uh, back in 2013 when we launched O Love Only, our campaign to raise money to retire our debt so that we could just O Love Only to our community. 
And Dan and Tony kind of told their story of coming afterwards and hearing about it and praying and getting involved in that. Well, this week, I want you to hear from Glenn and Diane Hamilton. Glenn is also one of our elders, and he's going to tell you a little bit of their story uh, related to O Love Only. So let's show that now. Hi, I'm Glenn Hamilton, and I serve as one of your elders here at Hill Country Bible Church. And this is my wife, Diane. Uh, she's a volunteer on staff here at church, and she was the founder and uh, coordinator of our compassion ministry called Restoration Blessing. I think back to when we were praying together to uh, come up with what God would have us give to O Love Only, and uh, remarkably, God put the same number on both of our hearts. We told each other one day and it was exactly the same number. And uh, it was a fairly substantial number and we knew the only way we could take care of it was to dip into our uh, retirement savings. Uh, so we did that, being confident that God would take care of us and being confident that I could put a little bit of back before I planned to retire. But then God coordinated some events that uh, allowed, or he encouraged me to retire early. But even so, as we look back, we have no regrets about anything that we've given to this church and to God's kingdom. Uh, so now we're, we're praying again about would God have us extend our gift or, or uh, to expand our pledge in order to finish off paying off this mortgage. And as we do that, we, we're confident as we look forward because we know that one day we're going to have to give an accounting to Jesus for what we've done. But we also know that uh, while we'll have regrets, we know that we will never regret anything we've given to God in His kingdom. So honey, what do you think? I just love this idea to have the opportunity to serve the Lord in this way and to just see what He does in our church. And uh, I'm not afraid. I'm, I'm very excited, in fact, to see uh, what God does as we um, obey Him and, and give. And uh, you can count me in. Me too. Count us in. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so uh, in response to today's message, I, I want to talk about something that's really, it's kind of an internal matter for those who call Hill Country Bible Church their home. If you're here today, you're just visiting, or maybe you're not even a follower of Christ yet. You're just exploring. I just want to say to all of you that we're really glad that you're here, but just allow us for a moment. Let me just talk to those who are really here who call Hill Country Bible Church their home. Most of you know, as we've been communicating, that we were on the winding, we're winding down, we're on the last lap, if you will, of this three-year campaign called O oh Love Only. As you know, many of us have made a commitment to be praying. We're about halfway through 28 days of prayer, where we're all praying about like what would be our next step uh, in, in terms of uh, O oh Love Only. Uh, it's a three-year campaign. We've got about nine months left on the campaign. And we're basically just calling us all together in unity to pray about, okay, Lord, what's my part? Like, do you want me to give? Do you want me to do something? Well, um, I'm going to show you this, this pledge card right here. And in a minute, I'm going to put this, this in your hand before you leave. This is just the tool that we use for people to communicate back to us what has God said to you during the prayer process. You know, notice that after some initial communication, um, initial information, it just asks you, first of all, with this statement, by faith, I commit the following pledge over and above my regular giving to retire our debt so we can owe love only. Okay, that's a reference to Romans 13, 8. So there you're basically saying, okay, like I'm, I'm, I'm making a pledge and I'm going to give you the details here in a moment, but I'm making a pledge by faith. And uh, um, it's over and above my regular giving. So if someone is here and they're kind of moved to do something and you're not regularly giving, uh, don't do O Love Only. Do, do start your regular giving that, that goes to sustaining the work of this church, okay? That's, that's how this church is funded, through the regular giving of followers of Christ who are part of our church family. So if you're not giving at all, start there first. But O Love Only is over and above that. And so if that's you and you're willing to make a pledge like God's given you the faith and courage and desire and eagerness to do that, then you would check yes. Count me in here by faith. I'll make the following pledge. So your pledge can be made up either of cash or non-cash, you know, stock or some asset or whatever that you would liquidate or have us liquidate for your gift. But regarding cash, there's two groups of people. 
There's new participants and current participants. And here's what I mean by that. New participants are those who were not here when we launched O Love Only in 2013. You know, they weren't part of the church. So they had no way of being involved. Well, now this is your opportunity to be a participant. You could say, hey, count me in. I want to come alongside and help you guys finish, get across the goal line. And so you were praying and then you have a chance to like communicate what is God laying on your heart to do, whether you know that's a, an amount weekly or monthly or maybe it's a one time, whatever. So you have a choice to kind of communicate that. Uh, also, new participants could be people who were here back in 2013 when we launched. But at that time, God did not lead them to give. Like they, they prayed and God said, no, God said, wait. This would be a time for them to revisit with the Lord. Would you have us do something now with these last nine months to get them over the goal line? So you can pray through that. And if God leads you to do something, you would fill that in. Second, of current participants, these are the ones who were here and they made pledges. Okay, so they, they made a three-year pledge and you know, they gave something. And maybe it was all in one-time gift or maybe they've been paying monthly or, or weekly. But they're currently doing it, and they can communicate that, praise God, like, I'm, I'm paying my pledge, or I'm, I'm giving my pledge, and uh, uh, my, that's my plan to finish. This was the original end date. But then the next option they have to pray for is, yes, count me in to extend my current, what, if I'm giving weekly or monthly, to extend it by three months to August. So now the end, the new end date, for the O Love Only campaign is August 28th. And so those who are currently giving, they can pray, God will say yes or no, about would they extend for those uh, three months to the end of August. So pray about that. So whatever God says, you communicate that. And then the non-cash pledge, we talked about that earlier. And then there's a place to total. And then there's a place that says, I believe God is directing me not to pledge at this time, and so you can communicate that, and we're real happy with that. We're, we're real happy with anyone who prays and does what God says, whatever that is. And so you go through that process, let us know, and then two weeks from now, on December 27th, for all of us who are here, I know it's a heavy holiday traveling time, but December 27th, everyone who's here, bring your pledge and we'll have, as part of our worship that day, a time where we come and present our pledge as an act of worship to God, dedicating to Him these funds for the purpose of paying off our debt and, and loving our community. If you're not going to be here, then you'll have opportunity to drop it by the office or mail it in, I don't know, scan it and email it. But the 27th is the day that ends the 28 days of prayer. That's the time for we're asking you to communicate what has God laid on your heart to do. Okay, so I, that's where we are. And so we have a real tight application, don't we, for what we're learning in Corinthians. And I would just say to you what Paul said to the Corinthians. Remember Christmas. That Jesus, though he was rich, became poor. So that we who are poor might become rich. And as we said, what that really translates into us is that Jesus became poor materially so we could become rich spiritually. And when you choose to give like, over and above like what the Corinthians were being challenged to do, you're choosing in the same way you're re-gifting Christmas by saying, I'm going to become materially poor or less materially rich <laughs> so that others could be spiritually rich. Because this isn't just about paying off a debt. This is about doing that so that we can more aggressively love our community, so that they can become spiritually rich. But it comes at a cost of us becoming materially poor, even though we're not poor. We all know that. All right, well, that's, that's uh, what God's doing in front of us. Let's go ahead and pass out these, uh, uh, these cards. I want you to have them two weeks early, just so that you can have time to continue praying over them if you're married you and your spouse have time to really look at that. Put it somewhere where you see it every day. Begin praying, uh, continue praying, and then we'll move toward the 27th. Let me get the worship team out of here. We're going to uh, close with a worship song together. I'm going to pray for us even as they're uh, passing these things out right now. Lord, 
we do just give you thanks for what you're doing in our life. Lord Jesus, this time of year as we talk about God with us and uh, Lord, you leaving your home in heaven and, and uh, coming and being born in a manger and living and eventually dying for the sake of our sins. Uh, Lord, when we think about all of that, uh, we are motivated, God, to uh, out of appreciation uh, to, to model what you have done. And that, Lord, uh, it, it's part of like being a good neighbor, of loving, loving others as uh, you love them and uh, loving others as ourselves. And Father, I pray that you would move through our church and that you would position us so that we owe nothing but this obligation of loving this community and that, God, that we would have the great, great privilege of expanding and uh, growing in all the different kinds of ministries to, to reach out to this community. We pray you would make that happen in Jesus' name.